So I too will begin by talking about how I got into this area. So when I was nine years old, I came home from school to find my mother bent over the kitchen counter sobbing. And wiping away her tears, she explained to me that my older brother, Ian, was on his way to the mental hospital, as it was called back then, where he would be living from now on. He was 13 years old, and I felt helpless. I felt afraid for my brother, living alone in a strange place. And I felt very worried for my mother, because I knew how much she had devoted herself to caring for Ian hoping that this day would never, ever happen. I'll always remember the first time we visited Ian. The hospital was fenced in by tall barbed wire fences. We knocked on two metal doors. I heard footsteps on concrete and keys clinging as two internal sets of doors were unlocked before the outside door was opened and Ian walked out. He looked so gaunt, such a sadness in his eyes. I just, I couldn't let myself think about what his life was like behind those hospital walls. He would beg mum and dad, don't send me back, let me come home. But they had no option. They just couldn't manage. They had to make sure he was safe and there was nowhere else to go. And it hurt my parents beyond belief to know that there was nothing more that could be done. Years later, I learned that my father had even contemplated ending his own life along with Ian's to end the pain for all of us. So this life, this set of experiences drove me to become a clinical scientist and a professor of clinical psychology. And I have dedicated my life's research to advance in scientific understanding about mental health problems so we can develop better treatments to help families like mine. Now, my brother had very little joy or happiness in his life, and he had many problems. One of those was depression. And as Nelson and Jonathan have indicated, depression is an enormous global problem. It affects our entire social fabric from infant development with the postpartum depression all the way up to huge economic gain complications. We've certainly come a long way since the days of my brother's hospitalization, and we do now have some treatments for depression that work, but only a half of the people who are depressed in the United States receive any kind of treatment. And when they are available, they only work about a half of the time. Just think about that. It's simply astounding that in this day and age, when we've made such remarkable scientific advances for the treatment of medical conditions like cancer, that we've achieved so little in the field of mental health problems like depression. What's the barrier? So my parents' struggle to find help for Ian was met by another struggle of keeping it quiet for fear of what others might think. We kept it in the family. Depression and other mental health problems simply were not talked about back then. Shame and stigma around depression still pervade our society. I have worked with countless individuals who delayed seeking treatment for fear of being fired. Many who don't tell their family or friends for fear of being judged, and some who won't even accept their own depression for fear of viewing themselves as weak or inadequate. And how many among us have had those moments when we could sense someone was struggling, but we didn't know what to say? We worried we might make matters worse, and so we let the moment pass. Shame and stigma around depression are literally strangling us from moving forward. What if we could lift that shame and stigma? What if we could talk about depression like cancer? A disease to be addressed 
not a condition to hide. By accepting and publicly recognizing the enormity of this shared burden, we as a society can demand better understanding and better treatments through scientific discovery. Because we now have the science and technology to make the leaps and bounds that happen for the treatment of cancer. We just need to dedicate our resources to the topic of depression. And that is the challenge that UCLA has taken on. By working together at an unprecedented pace, we believe we can uncover the biological, the psychological, the environmental risk factors that cause depression. And with that information in hand, we can develop laser-targeted and personalized treatments that are much more effective than 50%. We can do so much more. And UCLA is already paving the way. Take, for example, the recent discovery of distinct astrocytes in the brain by one of our colleagues that could actually lead the way to new drug developments for depression. Or take the work that's going on at UCLA on transcranial magnetic stimulation and non-invasive procedure to different areas of the brain to provide hope for treatment-resistant depression. And we're also targeting other aspects of treatment resistance for depression. Just imagine for a moment if you lost the capacity to experience excitement about exploring a new place or contentment about spending time with family and friends. The lack of pleasure or joy, which by the way is called anhedonia, is very common in depression and it's a serious risk for other serious problems such as suicide. Yet our existing treatments have failed miserably in being able to help people to regain that feeling to feel pleasure and joy. We're quite good at helping people to feel less negative but not necessarily to help them feel more positive. And part of the reason for that failure is a lack of a guiding science. Well, that is about to change. Advances in neuroscience, which come across our animal and our human laboratories, have now identified the neural brain circuitries that underpin that capacity to anticipate and experience the reward of a positive event. And from that science, we've developed a new behavioral treatment that actually guides people in how do they search for and savor positive moments when they occur. And we're now using virtual reality technology to help deliver that treatment while at the same time measuring changes in the brain as people go through functional neuroimaging. And alongside this new behavioral treatment, we're also testing drugs that affect that same brain circuitry of reward, trying to understand precisely how they work so that we can make them even more effective. And these, is, these are just a glimpse, just some examples of the new treatments that are evolving from the science at UCLA and all the interdisciplinary research that's going on as part of the Depression Grand Challenge. But we can't wait for all of the new solutions before we take any action. We have to address the enormous treatment gap. Remember, only a half of the people who are depressed receive any kind of treatment, and that's in the United States. It's far worse in many other countries. So there are far too many people struggling alone with this disease. And as Jonathan mentioned, new technologies provide an answer. <laughs>